and welcome back to Bedtime Stories with Stephanie. In this introduction, I will be going over the past chapters and a little information. So if you would like to skip ahead to the story, just head up there. And if you would like to stay, I'm going to get started. So last reading was the prologue and first chapter of Prince Umbra, in which we met Bentley Ellicott, the thousand and first hero of the Borrowed Heart. And this chapter where you're going to meet the next two uh, protagonists of the story who will be helping Bentley with his journey. Uh, a young girl named Slally and Dr. Christine. Uh, this chapter actually gave me a lot of issues just to give you a quick heads up. I'm really trying my, my best with this, but this chapter is just kind of a little out there. Dr. Christine's supposed to have a German accent and I'm not very good at that. So I'm, I'm working on it. By, by the time I'm done with this book, I'll probably have perfected that German accent. <laughs> it's just uh, right now, this is my third or fourth take of this, and his accent is still a little off. So uh, if anybody is listening who either speaks German or knows how to do a really good German accent, I am so sorry if my poor attempts are offending. <laughs> Uh, other good news, um, I did receive my copy of the original Prince Umbra. As you can see, it's got that beautiful, like, pearlescent cover to it. And depending on which light it's in, it's a little pinkish here, a little yellowish here, silver here, purple there. And uh, so that was a cover that I described in the last introduction that caught my attention as a child. I have gone through both books, a few chapters that I knew of that were a little, you know, iffy on the kid-friendly theme. So in the 2002 version, that the one that I am reading, the sepia-toned cover, the portions that were changed were changed to be a little more kid-friendly, uh, as mentioned. So down below is going to be the Amazon page in order to buy Prince Umbra. Uh, it's going to be down there for every single video. And the pearlescent cover, if you want to get the 1984 uncensored version, uh, you have to go through used books to buy it. Uh, it is no longer technically in print anymore. So in order to get that version, you, you have to go through, through used books. Uh, in order to get the 2002 uh, sepia tone one, the one that I am currently reading, one is under mass production paperback. So depending on which book you want to get, that's how you're going to, to purchase it. And I do suggest Purchasing Prince Umbra. It is actually a really good book and I like it no matter which version I'm reading. I think it's a really good book to have in anybody's library. So again, if you really want to buy it, the links are going to be, you know, down below. <laughs> and so yeah, uh, so the books are really good. Again, I highly recommend them. And again, sorry for the kind of slightly bad German accent that you're going to wind up getting. My, my humble, most humble apologies. So let's sit back, relax, and listen to the story of Bentley Ellicott as he battles Prince Umbra. Listen and remember. Chapter 2 Bentley sat on a bench in a long hallway. He looked through glass doors at the spidery shadows of tree branches on a building across the street. The branches swayed in the fresh spring wind. A blonde lady and her little girl were sitting on a bench across the hallway. The lady was reading a magazine. The girl stared vacantly at the wall above Bentley's head. Her face was narrow and pinched. Bentley's father had brought him up to the university on Tuesday. For two days in this place called the Christine Clinic, they tested him, poked at him, and asked him questions. A doctor had tapped his knees until his legs jerked. They made him close his eyes, extend his arm, and try to touch his nose with his finger. Later, they stretched him out on a table as a machine with winky lights like a spaceship rolled back and forth above him. Then, they wired his head and arms and told him not to move while a needle traced grasshopper legs on a revolving drum. A lady in a white smock showed him pictures and got him to make up stories about them. He played a kid's game of fitting wooden pieces into holes on a board. For two hours, she asked him questions about himself and wrote the answers down with a fountain pen. Bentley got the idea they didn't like him. Nobody smiled at him. That made him feel even more ashamed about causing the truck wreck and being arrested by McGraw. It was almost as if he was being punished for keeping a secret and obeying the instructions he had been given before he was born. One doctor seemed to be trying to startle him into telling his secret. 
This man had big cardboard sheets with blobs smeared on them in black ink. He told Bentley to say the first word that came to his head when a card flashed up. Mentally, Bentley stepped into his magic circles and repeated the incantation taught him by the horseshoe crabs. When the doctor flipped up the card, Bentley didn't say what the shape really suggested to him. Other words popped from his lips. When they'd finished testing him, they told him to wait in the hall until Dr. Christine was ready to see him. Bentley stopped looking at the brand shadows on the wall across the street. They reminded him of spiders. Instead, he looked at the little girl sitting opposite him. He figured she was younger than he was. She was thin, and her whole body looked tight. Her face was pale as if she had a cold. She had tangled blonde hair and large eyes that seemed to be telling the world she was almost always scared. One of her hands was gripped so hard around the bench arm that her knuckles were white. She must have felt him looking at her. She lowered her eyes, then raised them, and stared at him. Hi, Bentley said. The empty expression on her face didn't change. What's your name? Bentley asked. The little girl looked up at the lady sitting beside her. Then she said, Sally. The lady lowered her magazine and smiled at Bentley. Her name is Sally, she said. She can't talk properly. How come? Bentley asked. His question seemed to encourage the little girl. She began to speak. The words tumbled from her throat in a beautiful torrent that sounded like sleet on the roof, a cat's purr, and a fluting cuckle of owls. The lady's smile was sad. See, nobody can understand her. She feels wretched when people try to have a conversation with her. She wants to know my name, Bentley said. The wind rattled the doors at the end of the hallway. Somewhere deep within the building, somebody was whistling. The lady lowered her magazine into her lap. The expression on her face was a mixture of puzzlement and doubt. She was pretty. Her hair fell over the left side of her forehead. Her hands were long. She was wearing a man's shirt, a black sweater, jeans, and tennis shoes. She put one hand under Slally's chin. Is that what you said, darling? Slally was grinning. She nodded. Then she turned back to Bentley and spoke to him in a whispery babble. What did she say? The lady asked cautiously. She said you have a big house with a porch, Bentley answered. She said it's close enough to walk here, and your father hasn't lived with you for a long time. Slally's mother let her magazine slide to the floor. She leaned forward, resting her elbows on her knees. She folded her hands and drew a deep breath. Bentley could feel her holding back excitement. My name's Ellen Drake, she said. What's yours? Bentley Ellicott, Bentley said. Mrs. Drake made his ashamed feeling stronger. She was looking at him as if he were something that lived in a tree. Are you Richard Ellicott's son? Bentley nodded. Do you know my dad? I know his name, Mrs. Drake said. He teaches here, doesn't he? Bentley nodded again. Can you really understand what Sally says? Sure, it's easy. Mrs. Drake sat looking at him for a moment. Nobody's ever understood her in her whole life, she said. How can you do it, Bentley? Bentley shrugged. I don't know. I just can. Even though he was loud a lot of the time, Bentley was also a great listener. He had listened to all the wisdom and foolishness ever uttered. To him, Slally's beautiful noises were a language she had made up for herself. He just listened to what she was saying. Mrs. Drake had been looking at him as if he were a problem she had to figure out. Suddenly, she stood up. Will you stay with Sally? Sure, Bentley said. I won't be long, darling, Mrs. Drake said to Slally. She walked up the corridor, pushed open two swinging doors, and disappeared into the testing area of the clinic. Bentley liked Mrs. Drake, but her questions made him feel scrutinized and peculiar. He looked at Slally and made his chimpanzee face. She laughed as if she had never laughed before. Then the expression of uncertain sadness softened her eyes again. She put her hands in her lap and linked her fingers together. What's wrong? Bentley asked her. Slally said that now he knew why she had to come to the clinic. She hated it, but she couldn't talk. Sure you can talk, Bentley said. You just don't do it like everyone else. This friend of mine who takes care of us, her name's Helga. She could only talk German when she came to live with us. Now she talks like my dad and me. Slally said that was different. Bentley's friend had learned. Slally told him she tried to make the same sounds as other people. It was like almost sneezing, but never quite doing it. How come you hate the clinic? Bentley asked her. Slally looked down at her hands and described all the indignities she went through three times a week at the Christine Clinic. Then she raised her eyes and asked him why he had to be here. Bentley's face got hot. They think there's something wrong with me, he said. 
I wrecked a truck. A real truck? Bentley nodded. He lowered his voice and told her about riding his bike over the highway every morning and what had happened on that last morning. Sally smiled at him. She said she was positive he had a good reason for standing beside the highway. She knew how hard it was to make anybody understand. It sure is, Bentley said, even if you can talk. Her large eyes looked at him anxiously. I can't tell you the reason, Bentley said. They made me promise I wouldn't. It's a secret. Slally nodded. Hey, listen, Bentley said, feeling lighter and happier. I'll bet there's a whole lot of stuff you've always wanted to tell somebody. You can tell me. Slally smiled again. Go on, Bentley said. What would you like more than anything in the world to tell me? She pressed her hands on the bench hunched her shoulders, and looked at the ceiling. She said nobody knew she could read. They thought she couldn't because she hadn't been able to learn to write at this special school they sent her to. Sometimes, she said, her mother got mad at her when she was reading. Mrs. Drake thought she was pretending so she wouldn't have to go outside. I'll tell her you can read, Bentley said. Suddenly, Slally seemed to fully grasp that he could understand her and that she could really tell him all the things that had been shut up inside her all her life. She pushed herself forward on the bench and spoke quickly, almost breathlessly, in the rustle of birch leaves, rabbit warbles, and the night sound of water splashing drop by drop. She told Bentley about her dreams, about what she saw on television, how she wished she could have another chance at learning to ride a bicycle. Her uncle had tried to teach her when she was six. She told Bentley about swimming, being car sick, knowing she could play the flute if she could have lessons, feeling sorry for the lady next door who cried, about loving dogs. Finley thought that her life seemed small as she described it, as if everybody treated her as special or invisible. She was still telling him things when Mrs. Drake came back with a doctor who used ink blot to try and make Bentley tell a secret. Slally immediately went silent. The doctor looked down at her with an unmeant smile. Now then, he said, what's going on here? Slally gazed at the floor and said they were just talking. She said we were talking, Bentley told the doctor. Hey, would it be okay when you ask her questions on the tape recorder she didn't have to talk about her birthday? The doctor stared at Bentley for a moment. Why? Do questions about her birthday upset her? She didn't have a party, Bentley said. She doesn't know any other kids. That's why she cried on her birthday, Mrs. Drake said. Bentley nodded. She wants you to know she can really read. Mrs. Drake's eyes widened. Then she took Slally's face in her hands and raised it. I'm sorry, darling, she said. I didn't know. Slally made a half smile and touched her mother's hand. I don't have an immediate explanation, the doctor said to Mrs. Drake. Let's carry on with Sally. Christine will try to find out what he can from the boy. Promise you won't make her talk about her birthday anymore, Bentley said. The doctor nodded. I promise. Thank you. He held out his hand to Slally. Come on, sweetie pie. We won't do anything bad today. Slally's hand tightened on the bench. She murmured a reverent protest. What's the matter? Mrs. Drake asked Bentley. Bentley felt embarrassed. She's afraid I won't be here when she comes back. Of course she is, Mrs. Drake said. Bentley, what are you going to do after you've seen Dr. Christine? My dad's coming to get me, Bentley said. Would you like to have supper at our house if that's all right with your father? Mrs. Drake asked. Yeah, Bentley said. Sure, we could watch television, he said to Slally. She slid off the bench and took her mother's hand and told Bentley he had to make his father let him come. I'll try, Bentley said. Then you could tell me more stuff. Slally's face was glowing. In a rushed windsweep of words, she said that if he told her his secret, she promised never to repeat it. Don't tell, Don't your, tell secret, your secret, secret unless, you're, unless offered you're offered love, love sealed, sealed in silence, in silence. Or, unless or unless someone, someone recognizes, recognizes what you, what you really, really are. are. Slally spoke again. What did she say? The doctor asked. Bentley got embarrassed again. She doesn't want you calling her sweetie pie, he said. The doctor started to answer. Then he put his hands in his jacket pockets and walked up the hall, talking to Mrs. Drake in a low voice. The double doors opened, and they took Slally into the testing section. Finley sat on the bench for ten more minutes. He was suddenly happy. No one had ever asked him to tell his secret. Nobody even knew he had one. Then he remembered again why he was at the clinic. He felt stupid again for trying to work on his courage by standing too close to the trucks. And he was still alone. There wasn't anybody grown up and wise he could talk to about his destiny, about what the cavern angel had told him, about how scared he was. He was still thinking about Slally and his own bungled attempts to test his courage when a lady came out of the hallway and said Dr. Christine was ready to see him. 
She showed Bentley into a big office and closed the door behind him. It was messy and sunlit like his room at home. Papers and books were scattered all over the place. An old man with a wart on his bald head was standing behind a desk glaring at a handful of papers, talking aloud to himself and sucking in his breath between his teeth. He was the ugliest human Bentley had ever seen. He was short and lumpy. His warty head was huge and had tufts of white hair sticking up like weeds around a parking lot. His face sagged down to a turkey waddle dangle of flesh at his neck. His skin below his eyes had drooped onto his cheeks. He had a big nose and a small wet mouth. He was wearing a rumpled white shirt with a seersucker suit. His black necktie was twisted under his collar. His hands were like big claws. So, he said without looking up, you are the boy who is creating all this fear? Bentley didn't answer. He wasn't sure what he was supposed to do. Sit, 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 the old man said, squinting at another piece of paper. He mumbled and tossed it aside. Make some place for yourself. Zit. Bentley took some books off a large leather chair and sat down on the edge. Behind the desk, the old man was still flinging papers around. Pretty soon, he'd stop that and start asking Bentley questions about himself. In his mind, Bentley drew the three magic circles and stepped into them. Silently, he began to chant the incantation of the horseshoe crabs. Aha! Bentley opened his eyes. The old man was now standing behind his desk, holding up a piece of paper. Now already, I find you. He dropped the paper, sat down, folded his gnarled hands over his bulgy tongue, puckered his lips, and looked at Bentley. How come you lose your papers? Bentley asked. Because I am a messy man, the doctor answered in his thick accent. Me too, Bentley said. The old man nodded. Now, maybe you will tell me something? You have made an uproar in this place? How is it you can understand this little girl? Bentley shrugged. I just listen to what she says. I am speaking English, the doctor said. But I don't sound like other people speaking English. This is because I speak another language first, German. I had to study English for a long time. You have never studied this little girl's language, but you understand it. Please explain that to me. I can't, Bentley said. Again in his mind, he drew three osprey circles and repeated the incantation. I don't know, he said. The old man looked through his office window. Outside, the spring sunlight had washed the air clean. The ground was wet, Zion, the man said, thinks that this girl is sick in the brain. Zion thinks that she is speaking no language at all. Just, he looked back at Bentley, just making mooky mooky noises. What do you think? We're studying science in school, but they haven't told us anything about that, Bentley said. Do you know my name? I forgot, Bentley said. Christine, the old man answered. Christine, doctor. Now, I am going to tell you something. Zions doesn't know everything. He wheezed suddenly. His body shook and he took out a handkerchief to wipe his eyes and blow his nose. Stepped the handkerchief in his pocket, leaned forward, and opened a folder. Bentley was feeling uneasy. He should have been serene inside his magic circles, armed with his chanted spells. But he wasn't. He couldn't understand it. He repeated the incantation twice more to himself. I have talked to your father, Dr. Christine said. I have read these reports about you. He picked up pieces of paper and squinted at them. Eccentric behavior, fighting, lying, jumping in front of a truck. He raised his head and scratched his nose with one crooked finger. Maybe you are angry because your mother died and abandoned you? Bentley was warm with shame again. His unease was growing. He shook his head. My mom didn't want to die. It wasn't her fault. Dr. Christine's watery eyes stared at him. The old man nodded slowly. Ah. He said softly. He studied the folder again, breathing heavily through his nostrils. And I suppose you can explain to me why you did all these things that everybody complains about? Bentley didn't answer. He stared across the office, silently, frantically chanting the words the horseshoe crabs had taught him. But the magic wasn't working. He felt as if he were out in the open, unprotected. He thought he was going to cry. Do you like stories? Bentley looked back at the desk. The slumped over old man was still staring at him. I guess so, he said. Me too, the old man said. When you were having these tests yesterday, they showed you a picture of a woman in the snow and asked you to make up a story about her. Dr. Christine took his handkerchief out and blew his nose again. Yeah? Yeah, Bentley answered. You told the story of Zedna, the Eskimo maiden. Only you used another name. Is this something you learned in school? Bentley didn't want to answer that. He didn't want to tell anybody that he listened to stories in the second air, but he was helpless. No, he said. 
only scholars of northern folklore know the story of one-eyed Zedna who married the bird spirit and was sacrificed see, by her father, Dr. Christine said. I heard about this Indian who fell in love with her and died. Yes, the son of the Gichi Mantu. The old man coughed and cleared his throat. Zedna had many zooters. He contemplated Benny while all the clocks in the world pushed time before them. Dr. Christie was having an unscientific thought about this boy. It was as if Bentley were a character from one of the stories that had obsessed the old man's life. Dr. Christine thought about all the children he had known, children in German hospitals where he had trained, children who sat in unquestioning silence among people waiting in an anxious gloom in a Portuguese refugee center, children made up stories that embodied the figures and plots of classical legends. They lived in uncomplicated proximity to their dreams. There were mysteries and truths in these stories and legends. Dr. Christie wanted answers before he died. He took a large card in one hand and looked down again at the diagnosis in the folder on his desk. The Ellicott boy was decidedly not like the disturbed children the old man usually saw. There was the business of the little girl and the story of Sedna. Dr. Christian whipped the card around suddenly. Bentley jumped back in surprise at the ink blot. It was a violent splat of black that seemed to threaten all the white space around it. Quick, Dr. Christian barked. Who is that? Bentley's brain cried a warning not to tell. Umbra! He blurted before he could stop himself. Dr. Christine put the card back on his desk. He looked out the window again. The big office was profoundly still. Bentley's heart was beating hard. He had betrayed his trust, and he had been betrayed. His magic hadn't worked. This old man had penetrated past the circles. He had brushed aside the charm and made Bentley tell a name from the deepest part of his secret. Dr. Christine turned his warty head back and looked at him. I have played a trick on you, he said. I am sorry, but I think you know something. Neither of them spoke for a moment while the world clocks ticked some more. Perhaps you would prefer not to tell me? You mean I don't have to? Bentley asked in wonder. The old man shook his head. No, I have secrets I would not wish to tell you or anyone else. Bentley looked at the floor again. Maybe he hadn't done anything wrong after all. He had been given magic to protect himself against enemies and people who couldn't possibly understand what he was. Bentley raised his head and looked at the old man with curiosity. It isn't that I don't want to tell, he said. There is perhaps some restriction on you? The sound and light of the grotto where life begins filled Bentley's mind. Once again, he gazed up at the cavern angel and heard his voice like a cherubim song telling him to keep his secret. These doubting mortals mock the eternal purpose of heaven. Bentley blinked at the old man. They told me that no one would believe me. Ah, Dr. Christian said, folding his hands over his middle and squirming deeper into his chair. Belief, yes. That is a problem. People believe only these things which seem reasonable to them from their own experience. Do you find this to be true? Uh-huh, Bentley said. The doctor was spinning a web of easy familiarity around them both. Me too, the doctor said. He twisted one side of his sagging face and sniffed. I am a doctor. Children's minds. There is something I believe. It is not my own idea. He sniffed again. There is a theory. You understand theory? Yeah. That we are born with memories of what happened in the world before we were here. I believe this. Bentley's wonder grew. Not just what happened in the world, he said softly. Because I believe this, Dr. Christine said, this theory that we are born with ancient memories that only a few people can resurrect from their minds, for me it is true until somebody proves it, it is rubbish. His small, shining eyes fixed on Bentley. What is your opinion, please? Bentley was awed. Never had it occurred to him that he would find someone who would recognize what he truly was, someone to whom he could tell everything. I think you're right, he said in a small voice. So, Dr. Christine murmured, if you wish to tell me about Umbra, it will be true because you believe it. And that is how, for the first time in his life, Bentley Ellicott told a mortal being his secrets.